the College Planning Edge. Multiply your odds of getting into your dream college and get your hands on thousands of dollars of fat, juicy scholarships. Brought to you by Lockwood College Prep, helping college-bound families get the edge in college admissions, financial aid, scholarships, and test prep. All right, welcome to the College Planning Edge podcast. This is Andy Lockwood from Lockwood College Prep. And this is a podcast that is all about helping parents and kids get into their dream colleges and pay wholesale prices for them by obtaining staggering tuition discounts, financial aid scholarships, that type of thing, even if they think they can't possibly qualify. So this is the first episode of the College Planning Edge And I wanted to talk quickly about the types of things you can expect from the College Planning Edge and kind of where it fits into everything that we publish. So we, we meaning Pearl and I, my wife, Pearl Lockwood, we do uh, a Facebook show every Tuesday called College Talk Tuesday, which is sort of a news format. It's about, you know, what you should be doing now. And it's me and Pearl chatting live on video, answering questions. And that is every Tuesday at 12 Eastern. We're mixing in this podcast, The College Planning Edge, which will be about more of a deep dive on various topics, uh, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, not necessarily tied to the calendar, but more kind of evergreen type stuff. So what I wanted to talk about today is a little timely. It's it's about, you know, I'm, I'm recording this in the beginning of December, and admissions decisions are being mailed out. Some are positive, some are negative. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what happens if you don't get into your dream school. Is your life really over? Uh, Before I do that, I want to tell you about one more thing that we offer for free. It is live coaching, free live coaching. And that is going to be every Friday college talk, I'm sorry, college coffee talk. That is Friday morning at 830 Eastern also on our Facebook page. So I guess it would be a good idea to give out that page. That's uh, Lockwood College Prep. If you go to facebook.com slash Lockwood College Prep, you'll find us. And what I'm looking for is your burning questions, whatever you want answered. And over the years of doing live workshops and live webinars, we've accumulated quite a fair amount of live questions. But this is your opportunity to speak to me directly for free uh, without paying us. That's what free means. And every Friday, 8.30, College Coffee Talk. Okay, back to today's topic. What happens if you don't get into your dream college, which we refer to as admissions Armageddon? So Pearl and I have talked about this a lot. Um, the, the deal is that getting into a top college or not getting in can certainly mess with your emotions and your, psycholog- your, psych- your psyche. But... Uh, the if you if you put that aside for a second, which is possibly easier said than done, and you think about this process rationally, that's a new approach to college planning. It doesn't really matter so much where you go to college. There is no correlation between getting into a great Ivy League type college and financial success. I don't know how well what other types of indices there are to measure success, but there certainly is is a complete lack of indication of any correlation between going to Harvard and being guaranteed to make five million dollars. I can tell you in my case, when I, I grew up in uh, Newton, Massachusetts, which is right outside of Boston, right across the Charles River from Harvard, and we had about six hundred kids in my class. We had numerous Harvard alums and, I guess, professors, uh, people related to Harvard, living in Newton. So I think my senior year of high school, we sent seven kids to Harvard, which was not a particularly large number. It was just, I think, a a typical number. Because due to what I just said, there's a lot of Harvard alumni and and, uh, people related to Harvard in, in the area. I remember in my fifth year... Uh, reunion. I'm getting a phone call. I don't know if that means he's listening to me. So uh, I thought that was kind of interesting and I felt bad for the kid and all that. But what I, I, I learned years later, I'm talking 15 years later, once I got into the college planning field, I realized that over any 
20-year period, roughly 25% of Harvard grads are unemployed. So I'm not sure what the actual stats are now, if they've changed, but the implication is pretty clear that just because you go to a Harvard or probably any top choice, uh, top flight school does not mean at all that the rest of your life is going to be rosy. So in contrast, Pearl and I, in our practice, and Pearl does all the financial aid forms. She does all the FAFSAs and all the CSS profiles. She sees everyone's tax returns. She sees everyone's financial profiles, you know, how much they have saved, where they have it saved, the houses they live in, in many cases, the cars they drive and all that. And we have doctors and lawyers and CPAs and financial guys and CEOs as clients. We have a lot of people with very, very high income, six and seven figure incomes. We also have a fair amount of contractors and plumbers and electricians and jobbers, and you name it, as clients. And I got to tell you, more often than not, that second category of family is doing much better than the first category, the the quote-unquote professionals. And I'm saying better, maybe not in terms of income, but certainly in terms of assets, which is another big theme that we'll be talking about. It's not so much, you know, how much you uh, how much you make, it's what you keep. Or in college terms, I think the corollary is it's not necessarily where you go, it's what you get out of it. It's all about return on investment. So the point here is that again, there's there doesn't seem to be any correlation between where you go. And I, I know I'm giving you anecdotes right now, so I'm, I'm, I want to segue in a minute. But there doesn't seem to be a correlation between where you go, what you do, versus how well you are, uh, how, how well you do successfully, I guess, uh, in ter- financially. So many of you probably, um, you know, many of you guys listening probably had the same type of um, experience that we do. I mean, it, we, sometimes the biggest morons seem to be doing the best financially. You know, kids we went to school with who you could barely walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, are now making gazillions of dollars. And you know, a lot of times, you know, the people who went to fancy schools and grad school, or whatever, are kind of resentful of the morons. But you know what? That doesn't really, it's not really productive. That doesn't really get you anywhere. The purpose of this conversation we're having right now is to talk about reality. So circling back to my original point, which was, does it really matter where you go to school and don't be crushed if you don't get in? Think about the long game, not the short game, not about bragging rights, not about the rear window sticker, but what that could translate into in terms of the the long term. So frequently when I am coaching students one-on-one, we'll be looking at a set of colleges, you know, sometimes as early as freshman or sophomore year, but generally these conversations are in junior year and senior year. And I will point out a few schools that are, you know, great fits compared, uh, compared to what I know about the kid after we profile them and put them through an assessment and other types of uh, ways to get to know them. And very often I'll get a comment like, well, I never heard of that school. Yeah, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go to school that no one's ever heard of. Or, wait a minute, that's an easy school to get into. A bunch of dummies go there. I, don't, I didn't work that, this hard in, in high school to go to a, a school with a bunch of idiots. And my comments on that are, yeah, I, I do get that. I understand the emotions about that, but get over it a little bit. I'm not saying you should go there. I'm saying round out your list just in case you don't get into Harvard and Duke and those types of schools. And on top of that, very often these schools that you may not have heard of or you may think are for dummies or whatever might actually be better for you when you play the long game. And I mean the 40 years after college, not so much the four years of college. So if grad school is on the horizon, for example, you can you, you might have a much better job, uh, but much better time have, have greater odds of getting into a top grad school if you're coming from a quote unquote less competitive undergrad where your GPA is much more likely to be a lot higher, because GPA and you know in in uh, law school LSAT or med school MCAT those are really important, but it's a lot harder to get a high GPA at a school that you just barely got into that you had to scratch and claw and beg, borrow and steal your, your way to be admitted into. That's one thing. Then there's the money aspect of it. You're much more likely to get money from a school that really wants you to come. 
So if you're applying to a school where you look at last year's applicants and you look at their grades and their scores and you figure out, okay, I'm in the top 25% compared to last year's kids, I have a pretty good shot at getting in. You also have a very good shot at getting money from that school. And that, again, can help pay off when you're playing the long game when you look at the total outlay between undergrad and grad school. It's staggering. You know, and we have in our practice, we have two sets of two types of families, two sets of, of families who can, you know, a lot of them can't afford, they don't have the money lying around to pay for everything. But probably about 10 to 15 percent of them do have the money lying around to pay for college and law school or medical school or whatever, but they just don't see the value. And that's really what I'm talking about here. So, not so much getting the money for it, but the value. If you're playing the long game, it's very hard to justify going to a, an undergrad school just for bragging rights where you're paying an extra ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars per year only to drive that sticker around the, the rear window of your car so all your friends can say, oh, good school. <laughs> I don't have anything against those schools, just to be clear. I'm just saying that you shouldn't just stop at prestige. That shouldn't be the sole determinant. Look, Pearl, my wife, went to Cornell. I went, which is a rear window sticker school. I went to Wesleyan, which, you know, might be in some circles a a rear window sticker school. We both went to law school at St. John's. We thought that was going to be a cakewalk for us coming from where we came from. We got our butts kicked every year by the girl from Queens College who was brilliant. And I guess she could have gone anywhere and, and gotten great grades. But she wiped the floor with us. So, so that was very humbling, and that's another. That was another lesson I learned. That's kind of you know formulating all this, uh, all the thoughts that are being jumbled out here today in this episode, this podcast of the College Planning Edge. So, um, the non-anecdotal stuff that I promised. So, so if you Google Kruger and Dale, K R E U G E R and Dale, they're a pair of economists who did a couple of studies that track the success of kids and tried to see if there was a correlation between where they went to college and how much they earned. So the first study they did tracked one set of kids who got into Ivy League and super competitive schools that are similar to Ivy League schools. Half the kids went to the ultra-competitive college, and the other half just went to a regular school. And after 10 years, their earnings were identical. Then, very, you know, I find these studies not only the results to be very interesting, but the studies themselves, the design to be very clever. So the next study that I've, uh, I, I believe that they did to update this tracked uh, a different cohort, different set of kids, but this time, even though they had similar academic credentials, meaning a high SAT score, and that there may have been one or two others, this time, half the kids got in to an Ivy League or equivalent college and went, and the other half did not get in They were rejected by an Ivy League college or equivalent. And you know what? After 10 years, same result. There was zero difference in earnings. So to me, what these studies imply is, number one, it's not important where you go to school. It's it's that you go. But number two, it's really more about what you put into that college. And I could see, because I see this a lot um, in my own practice, when kids are maybe denied by their top schools, they go into the lesser school, the ones they're quote-unquote settling for, and maybe they have a little chip on their shoulder. You know, Maybe maybe they have a, a desire to outwork the people that did get into the Ivies and they, that they felt wasn't fair and all that type of thing. I don't know. But what kids put into school is, is overlooked everywhere because I think it's probably not possible to quantify that so much. I haven't seen a study about that. But if you look at college rank or, or any type of reputation or all the websites or whatever where they're talking about job placement rates and U.S. News and World Report and all these other types of things, th- those are all good things to think about. But but what gets overlooked is how is what kids put in, not not what they get out of college, but what they put into it, because they are they are directly related. So kids need to have a plan going into college, not, not just to get in, but what they're going to do once they're there. And that means, to me, that means availing themselves of the resources of the career departments, any type of uh, you know alumni networking support, and a bunch of other stuff that's beyond the scope of this episode, but I promise I will get to it later. So I, I think I'm done covering everything I wanted to today. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us on the inaugural College Planning Edge 
podcast, I want to remind you that every Friday over on our Facebook page, if you just go to Facebook slash uh, facebook.com slash Lockwood College Prep, you will see not only College Talk Tuesday, which is every Tuesday at 12 Eastern, but also starting now, starting in December, our College Coffee Talks, which are going to be on Fridays at 8.30. That is an opportunity for your free coaching. Any type of burning question, any problem you're having, any dilemma, any maybe you're getting conflicting information from your guidance counselor and other parents, maybe you're getting no information from your guidance counselor, maybe your kid has uh, opinions that you think are nuts, or maybe you are a kid and you think your parents are nuts, you know, whatever, That all these types of things, they're all fair game, great opportunity to pop on over to College Coffee Talk Friday, 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. Okay. Thanks for listening to the College Planning Edge. I am Andy Lockwood, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Andy Lockwood. Don't forget to visit our website, lockwoodcollegeprep.com, for some more free, valuable information on how you can multiply your chances of admission to your dream colleges and qualify for thousands or tens of thousands of dollars of fat, juicy scholarships along the way. Visit LockwoodCollegePrep.com for information on our free upcoming workshops and webinars and to download a copy of our number one best-selling book, How to Pay Wholesale for College. That's LockwoodCollegePrep.com. Bye-bye.